Hello and welcome to Camp Kaiju Monster Movie Reviews. We are your hosts, Matt Levine. And Vincent Hanna. And we are talking about all of our favorite monster movies, the good, the bad, and the downright campy, and asking if they stand the test of time. Traditional kaiju, creature features, space invaders, the supernatural, and everything in between. All strange beasts are welcome here. Camp Kaiju is sponsored by Zach Linder and the Zach Pack, powered by Coldwell Banker Realty. Your source for real estate, home rehab, fixing and flipping for investor clients, and residential buyers. Reach out to the Zach Pack today for real estate services, follow the Zach Pack on social media, and contact the Zach Pack for investment opportunities. Links in the bio. Thank you all so much for hanging out and listening. We really appreciate it. Please rate and review wherever you listen. You can also share this podcast with a friend. Uh, finally, please do send us your listener comments at campkaiju at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. If you have any suggestions for movies to talk about on future episodes, please let us know. Vincent, how's it going? Oh, so good, man. We just wrapped up a great discussion on The Birds. We dropped that episode last week on the podcast. And this week, uh, we we settled on Orca. I'm very happy we did, but um, we had a few nature run amok films uh, we had to choose from. It was a kind of a tough decision. It was indeed. I, I proposed a couple spider themed titles, including Arachnophobia, Tarantula and Kingdom of the Spiders, which was sort of stupid on my part because I'm actually scared of spiders. So when it came time to choose a movie, Orca was my obvious choice. So here we are today. Ah, uh, man, I'm not mad about it. No, well, that's that's good to hear. Um, I was all down for arachnophobia, um, but I'm I'm very happy to talk about Orca as well. I'm sure arachnophobia will return to the podcast at some point. Oh, yeah. We're going to do this for the rest of our lives. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I did sign my contract in blood, so that is true. Yep. <laughs> and if you quit, I will I will ruin your career. <laughs> in, the, in the ways of Alfred Hitchcock. Yeah. What career am I right? Ew. No. <laughs> uh... Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, Vincent, what's going on at our website, Camp Kaiju Movie Reviews.com? Oh, Camp Kaiju Movie Reviews.com is where you can find past episodes of this podcast. You can also read written blog reviews uh, from Matt and I. Um, every once in a while, we're we're getting those out when we can. Um, but right now, seems like we're just kind of focusing on the audio show, which is all right with me. Um, we've both got lots of things going on. Uh, but yeah, CampKaijuMovieReviews.com, the place for monster movie content. Indeed. And as we get closer to Halloween season in October and things settle down for me personally a little bit in my own life, I am excited to write more for the website. So keep on checking it out. Hopefully there will be more of you soon. Same. Um, also, our Instagram. Did you say this already? Our Instagram is a pl- great place to to find us. I did not. Ah, okay. Instagram at camp underscore kaiju. Um, that's always a good. That's probably the best place, honestly, where you can drop us notes and reviews and comments, um, as well as on your favorite podcaster uh, programming. What? Your favorite podcatcher is the term um uh, yeah look we always enjoy hearing from you we also have a couple exciting announcements about minnesota web fest coming up we have been nominated for two awards uh best podcast concept and best minnesota podcast is that right i think that's right yeah that's right so yeah pretty exciting thanks to whoever nominated us um <laughs> even if it is just some ai bot out there thank you uh sentient ai being and yeah, we'll see what happens. Pretty, pretty cool. If anyone from Minnesota Web Fest is listening, you are a legit uh, worthy festival that we we are honored to be a part of. You're you're you are real flesh and blood humans and not our our uh, Android overlords. <laughs> not yet. Anyway, <laughs> we'll see what happens. And I just want to give a special thanks to our patrons, Jason, Kelly, Peggy and our anonymous donor. Thank you so much. We hope you enjoyed. Perfect. Um, We have some great episodes coming up, too. Um, 
our next episode is going to be kind of another nature attacks movie. It's called of unknown origin starring Peter Weller in which he battles a giant rat. I'm very excited to talk about that movie. (laughs) And then what's our episode after that, Vincent? We will revisit King Kong, but we will revisit the 1976 adaptation with Jeff Bridges and I almost said Jessica Tandy. That's not true. (laughs) We've been talking about the birds too much. (laughs) I I know. Um, No, who is that? Jessica Lange. Jessica Lange, of course. Um, So excited to talk about that one. And that that will complete our our, uh, King Kong representation for the like traditional story or telling of that story. We did the 05 version, we did the 33 version, and now we'll do 76. Maybe we'll turn to Kong Skull Island next. Yeah, there are still still quite a few Kong movies out there. Yeah, King Kong versus Godzilla. That's another one, right? Yeah. Or is it Godzilla versus King Kong? Both. There are two different movies? <laughs> yeah. Wow, all right. <laughs> There's Toho's 1962 King Kong versus Godzilla. That's the one I was thinking of. Yeah. And then there was the one a few years ago. That one's Godzilla versus Kong. Wow. We, then, we really. Sorry, go ahead. Next year, Godzilla and Kong is being released. The sequel to the previous one. We got our work cut out for us. <laughs> but tonight we're talking about Orca from 1977, also known as known as Orca, the killer whale. Uh, Vincent, what is your history with this movie? Uh, well, I was, I was interested, I was introduced to this movie via this podcast. I think you mentioning it, um, other than that, yeah, it was probably in the same like bargain bin in my brain of, of animal movies like Jaws, Alligator, Piranha, uh, you name it. There's the swarm. There's, um, Grizzly. I think that's another one. Grizzly. Grizzly is like on the Mount Rushmore of giant animal nature run amok films uh tentacles is another one by dino de laurentis um who also produced the king kong 76 yeah well it's our motif coming up for the next couple weeks you remember the last dino de laurentis movie we talked about oh man um no i don't think i do it's piranha 2 the spawning wow (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure that is when we started talking about Orca because we talked about, yeah, Piranha 2. And I, well, maybe we didn't do an episode about Piranha, but we certainly talked about it on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, around that time, we were like, yeah, Orca, we got to watch that at some point. So, so I'm I'm excited. It's, it's come up at long last. And I just want to say this movie <sighs> blew my brains out. It was just equal parts deranged and yet sincere i i i am all over the place with this movie totally yeah absolutely agree um it's so over the top in some good ways a lot of bad ways but you know we'll we'll get into that shortly yeah um but let's dive into the plot synopsis um if it's okay i'll just start off with the first paragraph and then we can switch off sure all right So Captain Nolan, an Irish-Canadian living in South Arbor, Newfoundland, and his crew are hunting a great white shark to sell to a local aquarium, but a diver named Ken is targeted by the shark. An orca, however, intervenes and kills the shark, saving Ken's life. Nolan and his crew, now hunting the whale, try to capture the male orca, but Nolan mistakenly harpoons a pregnant female. Nolan and his crew get the orca on board, where she miscarries. The captain hoses the dead whale fetus overboard as her mate looks on, screaming in anguish. Oh man, what happens then? Seeking revenge, the male orca tries to sink the ship. One of Nolan's crew members, Novak, cuts the female off the ship, but the male leaps up and drags Novak into the sea. The next day, the orca pushes his now dead mate onto the shore. The local fishermen berate Nolan for his actions after finding the dead whale, insisting that he kill the orca since the whale's presence is causing the local fish to migrate. The orca terrorizes the village by sinking fishing boats in broad daylight and breaking pipelines, destroying the village's fuel reserves. Rachel Bedford, a marine biologist, shows Nolan how similar whales are to humans, and Nolan confesses to her that he empathizes with the whale as his own wife and unborn child had previously been killed by a drunk driver. 
Nolan promises Bedford that he will not fight the whale, but the orca attacks his seafront home and bites off the leg of his injured crew member, Annie. Nolan and his last remaining crew member, Paul, enlist Jacob Umalak, a member of the Mi'kmaq First Nations tribe, along with Rachel and her fellow scientist, Ken, to hunt the orca. The crew follows the whale and Ken is soon killed by the orca. They follow the whale until they reach the far north strait of Belle Isle. But when Paul starts to get into a lifeboat, the orca knocks him out of the boat and drowns him. The next day, the whale shoves an iceberg into the boat to sink it. Nolan harpoons the whale as he and Bedford escape from the boat, but Umalak is crushed beneath an avalanche of ice after sending out an SOS. Nolan and Bedford hide on some icebergs, but the orca separates them, trapping Nolan. The whale lifts Nolan up with his tail and throws him against another iceberg, killing him. With his revenge complete, the whale swims southward under the ice, while a helicopter is seen coming to rescue Bedford. Uh, surprisingly kind of a lot of plot in this movie for just a killer whale movie. Um, more than more of a plot than the birds. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't mean it's a better movie, but, uh, <laughs> it is definitely not a better movie. <laughs> yeah. We could, we could say that definitively. Yeah. But I think, ah, I, I'm jumping the gun here. I, 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 science nerd disclaimer. Um, we will refer to the orca as a whale and the killer whale. We know it is a porpoise. The orca is more related to dolphins than whales. I totally knew that. I know. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you for saying so. Thank you for saying what we both know so well. I can just hear the the trolls coming out and saying, <laughs> orcas aren't whales. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, that would have been just like a, a flood of hate mail. So I'm glad you cleared that up. <laughs> <laughs> Mania's mailbox just full of disparaging scientists. <laughs> yeah i'm a marine biologist and i have a bone to pick with your orca review <laughs> uh that would be awesome i kind of hope that happens we'll yeah see. seriously <laughs> <laughs> all right so let's talk about the cast and crew of this movie uh it was directed by michael anderson a british director who made some pretty well-known movies uh logan's run 1984 which is a surprisingly good adaptation of that book and around the world in 80 days he was kind of a director for hire who worked in many different genres Nice. Um, the film was produced by the aforementioned Dino De Laurentiis. He helped Italian cinema gain international recognition after World War II. This guy, uh, he's come up on our podcast before. He, for good reason, like his 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 resume is stacked. He's produced more than five hundred films, uh, some good, some bad. In 1976, he did move to the United States, and that's when he produced King Kong along with Robert Altman's Buffalo Bill and the Indians and Igmar Bergman's The Serpent's Egg. Um, so then Orca came the following year. I feel like Dino De Laurentiis is the only producer who, you know, produced some Federico Fellini movies and also Piranha 2 and Orca. I mean, obviously, he's the only producer who's done that, but still, it's pretty impressive. That is quite a range. Yeah. Uh, the film was written by Luciano Vincenzoni, who was also one of the co-producers on the film as well as Sergio Donati. Um, both of those writers worked on a lot of spaghetti Western films uh, with Sergio Leone, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, Once Upon a Time in the West, uh, a lot of other examples. Uh, the cinematography is by J. Barry Heron and Ted Moore. Uh, surprisingly beautiful cinematography, I would say, in this movie. Yeah, and a surprisingly great score by Ennio Morricone, um, the great Italian composer anytime his name comes up in the credits i immediately like you know sit up and take notice and uh prick up my ears a little bit is that the expression uh yeah. he's, he's one of the best yeah but but there was a a movie we featured recently with a score by him and it wasn't very good do you remember what that was was it wolf i feel like maybe he did the music for that it was wolf probably i wouldn't be surprised if he did some other musical scores for the movies that we've talked about too i think it was wolf and i think i don't think i i think i liked the score more than the movie i don't remember but i just remember watching orca thinking ah this is a score that that on its own can can hold water yeah <laughs> hold water nice yeah well <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think it's maybe like a little bit. Um, 
I, I feel like maybe he's mimicking himself a little bit. Uh, like his score in this sounds a little bit similar to some of the scores that he did for like Italian horror movies. I'm trying to think of some good examples. Um, now, of course, nothing's really coming to me. But yeah, it's it's good. It's good music for sure. Let's talk about the cast a little bit. The film stars Richard Harris as the main character, Nolan. He was an esteemed Irish actor who starred in many, many films, including The Guns of Navarone, This Sporting Life, Major Dundee, Gladiator, and I'm sure he'll be sad to know, rest in peace, Richard Harris, that we also have to mention he played Dumbledore in the first two Harry Potter movies. Um, he was kind of a little reckless, heavy drinker, heavy partier that kind of interfered with some of his film shoots, but a legendary actor nonetheless. Yeah, and it was only halfway through the movie I went, wait, this guy is vaguely familiar because I only know him from Harry Potter and he's a much younger man in Orca. Yeah. So it took me a second to to put it together. For sure. He, he's been around for a long time or he had been around for a long time. Yeah. I think he died. Well, he died kind of a while ago, 2005 or six, somewhere around there. Well, that's why he stopped doing Harry Potter. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Um. We have a Charlotte Rampling as Rachel Bedford. She was an icon of the swinging 60s who starred in such international films as The Damned and The Night Porter. Uh, she's great. I really like her a lot. She was recently in a movie called 45 Years. That's fantastic. So check that out if you haven't seen that. Uh, the film also stars Will Sampson as Jacob Umalak. Uh, Sampson is a Muskegee Nation painter, actor, and rodeo performer. He's probably best known for playing Chief in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Um, longtime activist, he was working on a film called The White Buffalo and halted production when he learned that white actors were cast in some of the native character roles. So I had never, like I had seen One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, but didn't really know a lot about him until I was doing research for this episode. So he's a fascinating guy. Yeah, same. This is the only other film I've seen him in. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, we have Bo Derek, another well-known figure. Uh, she plays Annie. This was her film debut. She'd go on to be a, a legendary heartthrob in movies like Ten and Bolero. But here she just gets her leg chewed off. <laughs> and that's about it. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, we also have Keenan Wynn as Novak. He was a legendary character actor in hundreds of films and TV shows, including Kiss Me Kate, Point Blank, Nashville, once Upon a Time in the West, Dr. Strangelove. Um, you, I, you know, you probably have seen him in a movie or a TV show, even if you haven't realized it. Robert Carradine was in this movie. I didn't know that. Yeah, in a very small role. He's the diver in the beginning who is being chased by the shark. And then he's, uh, you know, he comes back briefly towards the end to, like, help them on their whale hunt. And he's almost immediately killed. So not a huge role <laughs> in this movie. I, uh, yeah. I just know him best from Revenge of the Nerds. Yes, indeed. Very well known from that movie. Uh, he gave maybe his best performance in the movie Coming Home, which came out in 1978, a year after Orca. Um, so, yeah, Orca probably is not his finest hour, but but he's in it. It's an hour. Yeah. Yep. Oh, it's for him. It's probably really like two minutes total. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> his finest minute. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about the production backstory of Orca. Um, like so many other movies, this was a film that was trying to cash in on the success of Jaws. Uh, De Laurentiis, um, you know, explicitly said that he wanted to capitalize on that movie's success. He told the co-producer, co-writer Lorenzo Vincen Vincenzoni to, quote, find a fish tougher and more terrible than the Great White. And in real life, the Orca is the only... Natural predator of the great white shark. Yeah, so perhaps it is the only fish tougher and more right. terrible than the great white. Calls back to Quint's boat, the orca in Jaws. Nice, good throwback. Yep, yep. I'm all about the orca facts tonight. <laughs> <laughs> also, like, I love Jaws, of course, but I feel like you've seen Jaws way more than I have, right? Yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I don't I mean, have you seen that movie like more than a dozen times? Probably 100 percent. Cool. Yeah, it's uh, understandably. It's a great movie. Um, So we'll we'll go to you for the Jaws trivia throughout the night. OK, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> great. <laughs> uh, So it was Vincenzoni's brother, Adriano, who had an interest in zoology, who recommended orcas to Luciano. So uh, in a way, we have Adriano to thank for that. 
filming took place in Newfoundland, Canada during the fishing season. Um, do you want to talk about the orcas that were used in the film a little bit? Sure. Um, the orcas themselves were trained animals from marine land of the Pacific and marine world Africa, um, though artificial rubber whales were also used. The models were so lifelike that several animal rights activists actually blocked the trucks transporting them because they confused them for real orcas. Um, and I just want to look up marine land of the Pacific and marine world Africa. Do you remember where those are located? I don't actually. Oh, uh, Los mm -hmm. Angeles. Okay. Um, people get tired of me talking about being from Orlando. We get it. Theme parks. But <laughs> SeaWorld Orlando is also there. Um, and I grew up with um, orcas still being used as entertainment, as trained animals like Shamu. Um, they do not do that anymore because, what do you know, orcas are majestic creatures who need vast spaces in which to play and live. And if you handle violent animals, potentially violent animals, you can get killed. Um, and that's what has happened to several trainers. That's a tangent, but uh, I don't know. I think it's all all swimming around in there. Uh, second water pun of the night. Good job. You had You had one earlier. You said we're going to dive into it. I didn't even think about that. Wow. <laughs> That's how easy the puns are coming to us tonight. <laughs> um, I, I would also say that what you were just talking about is kind of one of the themes of Orca as kind of expressed through the Charlotte Rampling character. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. Yeah. Okay, great. Oh, I knew it. Nailed it. Yes. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> uh, by the way, the activists were not the only ones fooled by the fake rubber Orcas because the effects in this movie are pretty convincing like at times it seems like you're seeing actual orcas killed and maimed and bleeding and all that stuff so convincing special effects that makes it kind of a tough watch at times in my opinion it is a it is a brutal movie at times yeah uh it was also kind of a brutal production in some ways uh charlotte rampling had just gone through a divorce from her first husband in 1976 and richard harris uh started to drink heavily on set after he saw tabloid photos of his wife and Turkle with another man. In fact, Richard Harris was dead set on flying to Malibu to kill his wife and her lover, uh, only relenting after getting into a physical fight with Vincenzoni and getting a black eye. So that's an example of Richard Harris's um, behavior on set. And you know what? I feel like that is just uh, the character of Nolan. Yeah. Just in some scenes... If it's Nolan or Harris, either way, the character is deeply depressed. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Which, I mean, you know, if, if the character, if his wife, an unborn child, was killed only a couple years prior, that totally makes sense. You know? Yeah. And it, and I'll talk about this in my good, but I love Harris's performance in this movie. I think he he gives it a really uh, Shakespearean quality with. With just the tragedy of this of this man who's just trying to make a living and then this freaking killer whale comes along and ruins everything. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, it's strange because like his performance is pretty um, uh, melodramatic. You know, it's pretty over the top at times. But, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, like you, you feel for the character and it kind of works for the film. Everything is over the top here. So why not the performances, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, when the movie came out, it was a modest box office success, but it was ridiculed by both critics and audiences for imitating Jaws, of course. Um, it's it's a pretty critically reviled movie. I kind of hate Rotten Tomatoes. I don't really like to pay attention to Rotten Tomatoes too much, but it has like a 9% on there. So that gives you an idea of this movie's critical uh, response, you know, accurately or not. Which we'll talk about. <laughs> Damn the critics. Yeah, they don't, they don't know good art when they see it, <laughs> but it swims up and bites them in the in the on the nose. Oh, man, we I hope like the final version of this episode has like a like a whale pun counter, because I think we're at like five or six right now. <laughs> Ding. Yeah. <laughs> or it could just be the sound effect of the orca screaming in the movie, which. Oh, uh, my God. Well, it's going to haunt my nightmares for years. 
Okay, get get to the sponsor break. Get to the sponsor break. Yeah, it's a good time for that. Camp Kaiju is sponsored by Zach Linder and the Zach Pack, powered by Coldwell Banker Realty, your source for real estate, home rehab, fixing and flipping for investor clients and residential buyers. Reach out to the Zach Pack today for real estate services. Follow the Zach Pack on social media and contact the Zach Pack for investment opportunities. Links in the bio. Do we have anything from Minya's mailbox tonight? We do, we do. We have uh, on our YouTube page. Um, I've been I've, something new. I've started to upload our podcast episodes straight to our YouTube channel, which is Mischief Tales at Mischief Tales. We'll put the link in the bio. But we had a comment from um, Jason Caldwell five six two seven on our Starship Troopers episode. Now, Jason goes a lot into the uh, reading of the film, but I just want to kind of give a quick summation here. Jason calls attention to the fact that the the bug attack on Buenos Aires is a false flag operation. And our YouTube commenter goes into a lot of like pointing out specifics of like, if you notice this, this and this you could see that there's no way the bugs on clandatu could have actually carried out that attack hmm. and i don't want to get back into a conversation on starship troopers but but that's what i'm talking that's what uh, my, i think my main point of the movie was where it's like if that was the point i just needed it to be a little clearer for me to understand that yeah yeah, I mean, I think it's like a good and a bad thing about that movie, not to spend too much time on it, that it's so like um, subtle seems like a weird word to say, but they're like, like in relation to that movie. But there are some things that go like so far under the surface that it's like it can be easily be missed, you know? Yeah. And one quick thing, because I had. Uh, oh, oh, great. Jason, again, he uh, has now subscribed <laughs> I hope you're listening to this episode, man. Uh, he has now subscribed to our YouTube page because uh, he suggested The Mist as a as a movie to review. Um, I said we'd sure we'd throw it on our radar. And so, I would I love know. to revisit that. Yeah, I've never seen it. I haven't seen it for a long time. I remember it being an above average Stephen King adaptation. That is saying something, actually. Yeah, there's some good ones. Yeah, yeah. We could do the Some mist. Bad ones. We could do the mist and the fog. Ooh, I love that. Yeah, precipitation movies. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Yeah, can't wait. All right, what uh, what themes are in this movie, Orca Vincent? There are, there are a few. The first one that comes to mind is you know it's an eco, um, environmental disaster movie, man versus nature man encroaching on nature's territory and in and in this movie it is a very brutal visceral really really painful i think to watch violation of nature's domain i mean nolan doesn't mean to kill that female orca but the fact that he does and and the way it's depicted is very bloody and then the the baby whale comes out of the orca yeah, that will also haunt my nightmares. Um, it's 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 devastating if you're that if you're the Papa Whale. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah. Huge violation of like nature's uh beauty. I would say. For sure, it's a very long scene where they, you know, harpoon the female and then bring her on board and then she miscarries and then like it's it just goes on and on and it's pretty bloody and. Yeah, you don't blame the male orca for trying to um, take his vengeance, you know? Like, at the same time, the movie, I think, is kind of trying to say that, like, vengeance is kind of pointless and, like, harboring, you know, hatred for other people. I mean, like, we get this a little bit with Nolan, too, where he, um, you know, I mean, it kind of briefly alludes to kind of, like, his despair after his wife and unborn child are, are killed, and then I think he kind of comes to the realization after he kills the female orca that, you know, the only way to move on is to kind of forgive. But of course, the orca is not really able to do that. I read one reading that said that the orca, after killing Nolan, gets trapped beneath the ice in the like closing credit scene. And like the orca also dies. So it's like attempt to reap vengeance is, you know, 
devastating for itself as well. That's not the way that I read it, but it's an interesting interpretation. Yeah, I didn't see that at the end either. But another strong theme that occurred to me was um, the Catholicism of the movie. Hmm. It's a deeply spiritual and religious film, um, I think, if you want to lean into that. It's an Italian production. I mean, I'm not I am, you know, broadly speaking, just Italians love to make art about their faith and their church. And I am not Catholic and I won't pretend to speak about Catholic dogma, but Nolan has committed, as I read it, a sin against nature in what he's done. And it's unforgivable. And he dies at the end. And I was quite honestly surprised that the human dies in this movie and not the the quote unquote monster. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow. And there's scenes of Nolan in the church. He's asking the father for forgiveness and like, what would that look like Hmm. and i'm such a literary nerd uh do you know dante's inferno not very well but i've read some of it yeah um well the so the inner circle of hell is actually a frozen wasteland it's not a hellfire so in dante's hell it's ice it's an ice world and when this movie concludes in the arctic full of icebergs i'm just like oh my god (laughs) nolan has traveled to hell trying to to kill this beast and in the end it kills him i was like i was flipped on my head uh yeah that's where this movie i was like this is a masterpiece of 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 pulp cinema (laughs) wow i love that reading i never would have made that connection that's great yeah (laughs) that wow okay yeah i mean like especially because like You know, his original sin is to, of course, kill the female orca. And then after that, he pretty much immediately regrets it. And he's like, I don't want to hunt this male orca, but he kind of has to. That's like the it's the punishment that he's brought upon himself. He resists the whole time. And it's like he's a good person who just did a bad thing. And I find that very relatable, very human. Mm -hmm. And and also a shout out to the First Nations character in the movie. There are, you know, potential problems with that character aside. Uh, there is a there is a spiritual aspect to that character as well. So, again, this idea of like the 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 white man's Catholicism and the the native man's own religion and where those intersect. And yeah, I just found a surprisingly a lot amount of religious critique in this movie. Yeah, I totally buy that for sure. Maybe I like this movie more than I thought I did. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's certainly, I'll, I'll just say right now, it's not deserving of like the um, ridicule that it received, you know? It's, it's uh, there's a lot of good stuff to it for sure. But there, you know, there's a lot of really bad stuff too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, sneak preview, we'll get into that stuff shortly, but uh, are there any other themes that you want to bring up? No. <laughs> I think those, I think that's it. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of all I have for the themes. Uh, So, yeah, briefly, I think we can talk about the form and the aesthetic a little bit. I think some of this stuff will kind of wrap up in the good, the bad, and the campy. But for now, I'll just say it's a very well shot movie. There's like a lot more time devoted to very beautiful underwater footage um, than I thought there would be. And like, you know, the chance to sort of like watch orcas frolic in their natural habitat and listen to an Ennio Morricone score I'm not going to say no to that. It's it's great. It's very pleasurable. Um, yeah. So there's a, 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 like there are just some shots. Quick example, like some shots of like an orca like bathed in red and green light. Like that usually happens after it like you know destroys a boat or kills a person, and it's kind of like reveling in its violence or whatever. You know, it's like something out of an Italian horror movie. It's great. It's very very stylish. Yeah, any, I mean, anything else that you want to mention about the form of the aesthetic of the movie, or should we kind of mention that in the good, the bad, and the campy here? Well, I need to watch some some Italian horror films. It's a it's an aspect of film I have not uh, explored. Um, so you you have more insight, just like what you just said. For me, I'm just like that's just really interestingly lit and and very poetic. I found the movie rather poetic with its music and it and the way it is shot and it is melodramatic and but i it works for me i find it an, an intentional choice 
Uh, the orcas have a lot of grace to them. You sympathize with them a lot. I, I guess just one more thing about the Italian horror connection. You know, that that genre is known as giallo. Um, those films are from like the 60s and 70s for the most part, maybe into the 80s too. Um, and probably the best known example is Suspiria by Dario Argento, where in, in which like every shot is just like packed with like eye popping lights of like red, green, yellow, blue, like all imaginable colors. And it's just like a feast for the eyes. And I think it's an appropriate comparison because Orca, even though it was shot in Canada, um, is a very Italian production. You know, you have Dino De Laurentiis, you have Italian screenwriters, Italian composer. Um, so I, you know, I feel like maybe it is influenced by Italian genre movies a little bit with that connection. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess I, I will. I will mention the the because it is melodramatic. It is larger than life. Uh, and I think purposefully so. I will use that word Shakespearean again, just like the tragedy is so tragic. Like there's a there's a great shot of of Nolan atop his boat heading, finally heading out to sea to capture the orca. And he's got his like hoodie on and he looks rough. Yeah. But you can just see in his eyes, not quite a fire, but a resignation it's not determination it's a resignation to confront his fate i i think you're totally right about that yeah and i think the decision to shoot on location in newfoundland i think it was yeah um you know i, I don't know exactly if like the fishermen in the movie are like actual locals in that area but it does feel like it has that kind of like verisimilitude to use another word that i love a lot like you, you do it feels like very immersive you know yeah great location shoots yeah so yeah, a lot of a lot of good in this movie. I'll also just mention that this to me seems like a very sincere movie. You know, some of these monster movies seem like they're kind of making fun of themselves a little bit. They're not totally taking themselves seriously. They kind of look down on their characters a little bit sometimes, but not so in this movie. I think it it feels for its characters. It has themes that it's trying to present. Um, I think maybe it's a little bit like earnest to a fault, you know, like it's there's like no nuance or subtlety in this movie. But it's, um, you know, it's there's a lot of sincerity to it. And I'll that's like a, a forgivable flaw, in my opinion. Yeah. Was that the bad for you or the good? <laughs> well, I know it sounded maybe like the bad, but it's actually the good. Like, I'm I'm glad that it's like taking itself seriously and it has ideas that it wants to get across, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, Let's see my good. Let's see what I can parcel out here. Um. They go into the science of orcas, which I think is cool. The themes of, oh, orcas as an intelligent being. Like, these are smart animals. They're as smart as human beings. So, like, again, there's respect given to the animal. Um, the baby scene was horrific. I want to shout out, shout out the scene where the orca, like, destroys, like, a gas line or, like, main or something. And somehow starts a fire. I can't remember exactly how the fire is started. But then, like, the fire spreads all the way up through the gas main. And, like, the this entire, like, natural gas or something factory explodes. It's, like, not a special effect that I was expecting from this movie. <laughs> it's, uh, like everything else, very over the top. And I, like, almost spit out my drink when I watched that scene. It's It's really ridiculous and kind of amazing. And then the orca is relishing in it. It's doing leaps out of the water. <laughs> it's like so aware of what it's done. And it's so giddy about it. Yeah. It's, you know, a homicidal maniac, but it has like a a, a reason for its bloodlust, you know? It's, it's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For inspired. Sure. I mean, in, in, did you say inspired? I did. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed it is. And I do just want to say one more time, it's a very well shot movie. It looks great. Um, even like the, well, maybe not even, but especially the like sort of like Arctic scenes towards the end. I think they, yeah, it's it's a very kind of like surreal, um, you know, I think your kind of like comparison to the inner circle of hell is totally appropriate. It kind of looks like it. We should start a monster movie book club. This is like the third episode we've talked about a, a literary reference now. Yeah. I love that idea. <laughs> um, maybe on our website. Hey. Soon to come, perhaps. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> um, I do, however, want to say that there is quite a bit of bad in this movie also, at least in my opinion. Um, 
my first question is, is that actually what orcas sound like? Because in this movie, it sounds like it's like a blood curdling cry of an infant. And I don't think that is what killer whales sound like. It is the most atrocious sound effect I've ever heard in my life and not in a good way. Uh, yeah, I'm sure they were trying to like convey that whale that orcas are very close to humans, but that is not a very convincing way to do it. Yeah, maybe the idea was just to, again, humanize them. But uh, misfire, that is a bad choice, does not stand the test of time. That is, that's too much. It's too much in the world of make-believe, Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah, it takes you out of the movie. It's, um, you know, it's supposed to be kind of a dramatic moment, and that kind of does uh, limit its power a little bit, unfortunately. Oh, my God, it's awful. <laughs> there, you know, there are some other bad ideas, I think, too. Like, there are two moments where Charlotte Rampling has voiceover narration in this movie all of a sudden. Like, she does not narrate most of this movie. But then, like, in two scenes, she's narrating about things that she would not possibly know for the most part. Like, she couldn't have witnessed these things. She didn't know that they happened. So it's pretty sloppy narrative structure to have just, like, these two random voiceover moments. Completely behind you on that. The romantic relationships were muddled i didn't know if people actually like each other romantically or sexually uh then they i don't know yeah it was just weird in those aspects as well yeah including that one like very brief shot of i think it's ken and annie in bed together and this is after she's like been seriously injured and her leg is in a cast and it's like, do we like that doesn't really provide very much insight into their characters. Did we really need that? Yeah, it's almost as if the filmmakers went, oh, right. We we got to get some kind of love, love, uh, some sort of sexual chemistry in here. Yeah. Let's have a three second shot of these two characters in bed. <laughs> yeah. Um, Let's see. What else do we have? I, you know, I mean, like some of the bad stuff is also can be. So I feel like I can. Save that for a moment. I, I just to like to sum up the bad for me, I think, you know, there's not really a sense of like nuance or subtlety in this movie. And it makes it hard to kind of like really engage in the dramatic stuff for me. Um, the character of Umalak is boy. I mean, what do I know? I'm 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 a white guy. I I, you know, cannot speak to the native experience. Um I think as I think this character is completely tokenized as like the spiritual, um, the spiritual stock character, right? Mm -hmm. That yep. that native people can often portray. But then, but then the movie does take the spiritualness a little deeper. Again, maybe when it's um, compared and contrasted with Nolan's spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that forgives the the spiritual tokenism but maybe it justifies it but it's also it's still uncomfortable right it's still like oh yay representation but you're not you're not doing it right for sure yeah i you know giving the movie the benefit of the doubt i feel like maybe it is well-intentioned and has that sort of thematic contrast that you were talking about but yeah i mean it's like the wise mystical native american stereotype and it does not come across very well it is you know pretty hilarious at times like it you know it's offensive but like he just suddenly randomly appears whenever a character needs an epiphany like there's a part where like one guy i'm i, I think it's nolan but it might be somebody else just like walks out of a bar and like the the umala character is just standing there like leaning against the wall waiting for him to exit it's like how long was he waiting there for like an hour and a half just to, like it's ridiculous it's very yeah it's amusing but pretty offensive at the same time yeah, because he's magic. He's everywhere all at once. Yeah, I guess he foresaw the future and knew that that guy was going to be there. There's sorry. Did you have anything else in the bad category? Oh, like it's it's also. It, I think you could also consider it campy, but you know sometimes it's very obvious that the orcas are in a tank in a pool rather than the ocean. And when the when the camera cuts back from like clearly the location set of the harbor to a, a pool set with artificial lighting. Yeah. It's very obvious. The, the contrast there. 
I, I do like I think it looks good for the most part, whether it's shot like in the ocean or in a pool, but it's still distracting to like cut so abruptly from one place to another. Right. That's all. Yeah, for sure. There's definitely a lot more campy stuff. I, I I'll I think I'll just start with like the death scenes of the human characters, which are pretty similar. I mean, Annie's um, well, she doesn't die, but like her maiming is a little bit different. Mm. But like the other characters, like the orca jumps up like just chomps on a human <laughs> and it is like a chomp sound effect, you know, like somebody <laughs> biting into an apple or something. And then like the orca just like takes the human back down underwater and it looks really fake. And in one of those moments, it cuts to Nolan saying no in slow motion, which is just never a good idea. It's so ridiculous. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um. So yeah, these death scenes, not very scary or yeah, just hard to take seriously. Yeah. There's a great moment that's campy as hell when the orca looks at Nolan and you can it's a the shot is of the orca's eye and you see Nolan's reflection in the eye. And it's just like that orca's looking at you, man. It has your <laughs> number and you better watch out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> I read one review that compared this movie to Death Wish, another Dino De Laurentiis production. Um, and the review says that the orca is playing the Charles Bronson role, which I think is totally accurate. That's so appropriate. I've heard about that movie. I, I want to watch it. If I, I actually have not seen Death Wish either, full disclosure. And it sounds kind of terrible to me, but but I know about it. And, yeah. you know, it seems seems accurate. Uh, any other campy stuff? Uh, I, I just mentioned it in my bed, <laughs> honestly, yeah. like the screaming orca, the well, what I love actually is the orca just just being really playful when it the contrast of the playful orca with the exploding town uh, was just beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. That is maybe the best part of the movie, in my opinion. I was yeah, I was I was cracking up. It was so funny. Yeah. <laughs> And just like pretty, pretty early in the movie, there's a shot of like the two orcas because the female hasn't died yet. Just sort of like, um, you know, leaping from the ocean very majestically. And it's like, I don't know, it's kind of campy in like a new agey, like, you know, we're one with nature sort of way. Yep. That's kind of what I mean by like it's earnest to a fault, but at least it is sincere, you know? Yeah. All right. Well, should we should we wrap it up and give the movie our ratings? I think we could do that. All right. So as usual on Camp Kaiju, our ratings are number one, it's a timeless classic and definitely stands the test of time. Number two, there may be some antiquated moments, but overall it's great and stands the test of time. Number three, it may be historically significant or just fun, but does not stand the test of time. And our lowest rating, it is not worth revisiting and definitely does not stand the test of time. You want to go first? Sure, yeah. I had a different uh, rating chosen before we started recording but i think i'm gonna bump it up a notch uh there may be some antiquated moments but overall it's great and stands the test of time this is i you know part of it is just me wanting to like contradict the main critical consensus uh, in my stubborn way but like you know there's a lot of fun to be had in this movie it looks great i do like the music a lot um it has ideas even if it does not present them in the most sophisticated way um yeah i mean if you're gonna have a Jaws ripoff, this is about as fun as you can make it. And that's just it. Um, I agree with you. That's my rating. Because I'm also a contrarian, I I kind of want to give it like a full stop classic rating. But objectively, like in in like the world of cinema, this is not a classic movie. But for these these kind of killer animal movies, I think it deserves a lot more love than than it gets. I think it's not totally fair to even call it a Jaws ripoff because it does its own thing. Mm -hmm. um, I watched Alligator right after this and I found Alligator much more of a kind of by the numbers animal killer animal movie, uh, maybe a little less inspired, but that's a conversation for another episode. Yeah, I just I just love the risks it takes and how sincere it takes itself. Um. And we love orcas. So, yeah, I think it's great. <laughs> Despite the glaring faults with this movie. Yeah, 
but I, I think you're right. I, you know, you made the point before that like the human Nolan dies and the whale survives. So in a way, it's kind of the inverse of Jaws, where we're kind of like rooting for the shark to die the entire time. This movie is the total opposite. So yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, it is pro environmental, like full stop. Yeah. Awesome. Well, yeah, Orca, if you haven't seen it, it's better than the critical consensus implies. So check it out. It's a very fun movie. You heard it here, folks. All right. Thank you all for hanging out. If you liked what you hear, please tell a friend, leave a rating and review, and visit CampKaijuMovieReviews.com or Instagram for more monster movie content. We can't thank you enough. Camp Kaiju is... is <clears throat> let me take that again. Camp Kaiju is recorded in Minneapolis, St. Paul with theme music by Terrence Jackson and Minya's Mailbox music by Ben Cook Feltz. Camp Kaiju is sponsored by Zach Linder and the Zach Pack, powered by Coldwell Banker Realty, your source for real estate, home rehab, fixing and flipping for investor clients and residential buyers. Reach out to the Zach Pack today for real estate services. Follow the Zach Pack on social media and contact the Zach Pack for investment opportunities. Links in the bio. You're planning to capture and sell a fellow creature. He's like you. He has warm blood. He breathes air. He's a mammal, but with intelligence, and he communicates. Oh, he communicates, does he? He sounds almost human. The birds, I, it's fair to make that a longer episode, and I think, Orca, we can make kind of a shorter episode. Maybe. Um... There were a couple of things I wanted to even go on more about the birds. I did. I did. I felt like I had to shout out the actor, Vanessa Cartwright, who plays yeah. Kathy. Me and Ellen both went. She is like one of the best actors in this movie. She gives a really like emotionally impactful performance, which I enjoyed. Yeah. And also. Uh, I found the conversation, our conversation in the birds really interesting around the feminist aspects of the film mm -hmm. because on the surface i did not see that i just saw a movie full of females whose whole life circles around one man yeah and it's just like every conversation is about mitch boring though handsome mitch and <laughs> yeah I know what you mean, but then like, you know, certain little like snippets of dialogue and like visual representations like add a lot to their characters. So and I think just the idea of like a somewhat feminist movie made by a misogynist director is kind of interesting, you know? Yeah, and I think it is 100 percent fair to to criticize Hitchcock in that way. I mean, yeah. God, Marnie, I, I, I Marnie may have a lot of like insightful critiques around it but i'm i'm just not a fan of that movie yeah despite acknowledging whatever artistic lens there may be <laughs> i'm with you on that yeah it seemed like kind of an interesting sort of like hitchcock on the psychoanalyst's couch like laying bare his demons or whatever but it doesn't yeah. really make for a great movie you know <laughs> i was gonna say we didn't talk about the special effects in the birds at all which i really wanted to do i know we kind of like tiptoed around them yeah. But yeah, mechanic. Yeah, you let's let's talk more birds for a couple minutes. Cool. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, like there were some mechanical birds in the movie, but also I think like more than 3000 trained birds on the set that were like handled by a bird trainer. And it's it's a like, you know, I know the effects are kind of outdated in some ways, like clearly when the kids are running away from the school, it's like a composite shot that was like shot in the studio. Um, but you know, I, it's really, really effective. Like, even if the special effects are not totally convincing, they're still scary, I think, and very interesting looking. Yeah, I found I found the I found the bird attacks very visceral to mm -hmm. use a word you love. I do. Um, one more thing I was going to say about the. Oh, I actually think to one thing in, that Marnie, I think, has over the birds is Tippi Hendred's performance. I think. Yeah. Now that I've seen the two, I'm like, oh, The Birds is your debut. I can see you be a little, you're a little rusty. But in Marnie, yeah, she's in much more of a solid place. Yeah, for sure. A solid place as an actor, but maybe not so solid psychologically, given the torment of making that movie. But Oh, what a disaster. <laughs> yeah, man, poor Tippy. <laughs> so right. much to talk about, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um... <laughs> 
Marnie's come up before on this show. Yeah, I'm, it's a fascinating movie, if not actually a very good one. Yeah, can, can't deny that. Yeah. All right, how... Okay, let's let's talk about Orca the Killer Whale. I'll fight you! You're a vengeful son of a 